Hi, this is Satyarav Siddhanta and uh, I have climbed the highest mountains and the highest volcanoes of all the seven continents and currently hold the Guinness World Record for being the youngest in the world to do so. It takes, I take immense pride in fluttering the national flag in the most of the remotest and the highest points on this earth. So, Mount Everest, this is the picture I clicked in 2010. Now imagine, long back, long back where our convention history was uh, not there or the start of history, when the whole continent was one, slowly, slowly it broke off. Today's India was an island for many, many years, many million years. And one fine day, while floating as an island, it hit a big landmass. And the entire Himalayas was formed. And out of that Himalaya, Mount Everest is the highest point on earth, standing at 8,848 meter. But imagine, it has no competitors nearby. You know, the highest mountain is 8,848 meters. The second highest is almost 250 meters less, which is K2. Yet, its aspirations to grow higher never stopped till date. Guess what? It has increased its size, its height by 86 centimeter over the last uh, few decades. Who is it competing with? It is not competing with anyone else, but it is trying to improve itself. It is trying to uh, raise its bar. And I think this is what I learned from Mount Everest, that the competition is not against each other, but if we can improve ourselves day in and day out, if we can have that aspiration to improve ourselves, I think uh, there is no limitation that anyone can put on us. Now, the same Everest, when we go for climbing, it's a, it's a big, uh, what do you call, uh, a big pressure. Pressure of an Everest is on us almost. Why? Just as lofty as its height, the cost of climbing Mount Everest expedition, uh, I mean, like, it's huge. Uh, in 2015, when I was planning for this expedition, the cost for expedition of Mount Everest was $30,000. At that point, I was given a choice to e either go for climbing the mountain or keep my job. I chose freedom. Because that's where my heart wanted to be. That's what I was resonating with. Because when you dream something with so intense, when your determination is so strong, when your convictions are so strong, you will see you and your dreams are not two separate entities. It just becomes one. Now, I had no clue where this money will come from, $30,000. Here I have a threat of losing my job. And then I was not able to take that first step that how to uh, like ask money from anyone. But then somehow I pulled out of desperation, I went to my university, Manipal University, and surprisingly they gave one third of the expedition cost, they sponsored. Now I am in a dilemma. Now where do I find out the next two third? But when you follow your dreams and when you take that leap of faith, magic starts to happen. Funds came from unexpected sources, people started believing in my dreams, and they contributed towards the crowdfunding, and I could raise the next one third. And the next one third, the last one third, my parents and brother from their retirement savings, they contributed because all my money was going for the, ex the expenses of my previous expeditions that had accumulated over time. And now, life started becoming like a fairy tale. Wow, a dream I saw in 2010 when I went for Everest Base Camp Trek in 2010 after seeing Everest. In six, in five years, the dream is coming true and life is just getting unfolding. And I was on my journey to Everest, April 2015. We were almost reaching the base camp. We decided to take a break, have a coffee. Then that break was a little longer. We started having lunch. We got internet connection after many days. So we started doing, replying to all the WhatsApp messages from our near and dear ones. And when life was just about to unfold, everything shook. 
2015 April 25, the infamous earthquake shattered and devastated Nepal. More than 12,000 people unofficially were dead and many left homeless. 25,000 people almost were injured. We had no clue what happened. But we were there near to the base camp. Minutes after this, a huge avalanche got triggered at Everest base camp from a mountain adjacent to Mount Everest. And this is a snapshot from the video by Jost Kabush. He accidentally kept his uh, camera on. And there was a huge avalanche, and it killed 21 people there at the base camp. We got to know in minutes that our expedition got cancelled. The expedition was abandoned. $30,000 vanished. Dreams were burnt and broken and crushed and hope was strangled. And I didn't know what to do. I was like, the first stage was the denial. No, 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 this cannot happen. Definitely something is going to happen. How could it be? Then came anger. Why me? What have I done wrong? Do I deserve this? Such mental states was going through and I was getting carried away by all those mental states. I was pretty natural. I was so insensitive to the situation. I reached the next day to that base camp again to find out that is there a way that I can go to the camp to by helicopter and then take, like maybe open the route by ourselves and is there any possibility? Dead bodies were still wrapped in plastic waiting to get lifted in helicopter, destruction all, all over. And here, the insensitive me couldn't accept that things are all over. While I was walking around, like very, uh, like, you know, sad, I mean, all kind of negative emotions, name it. I came across a book. A book was not 1001 reasons not to climb mountains, but that book, I don't know whether if I have that picture, yes, this book was dead or alive. And I was so scared reading the title of the book. It was like as if a question was getting asked to me. Are you dead or alive? And I froze because I had no clue the person who was reading this book was dead or alive. And that moment was the acceptance moment for me. That moment I realized that I could have been dead. The place where I was about to have lunch that day, it was a Japanese woman's tent, sorry, Chinese woman's tent. Two Chinese girls were dead there. One Japanese photographer was dead there. My friend who was a co-guide there, he was hospitalized. And then I realized that it was the greatest gift that I am alive. Today, what have I lost? Yes, I have lost money. I have lost an opportunity. But if the conviction of my dream is strong, if I am determined enough, I know that I am going to come back. I will build the dream inch by inch. I will collect all these broken million pieces of dreams and I will build with the glue of hope. With that determination, everything became silent. And then I realized that this could have been a vicious cycle. This could have been a victim mindset that in the whole, whole life I would have been in that cycle thinking that, oh, I would have looked at that incident as something like, this happened to me, life happened to me, I couldn't go because of this, 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 this. But who is stopping me from achieving my dreams? What action am I going to take? Now, if I am in that vicious loop, I cannot take any action. Only when I start moving out from there, and the clouds of, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, negative emotions were always always there, like you know, that I, I was showing this picture. 
that uh, that time I might have excuses and all the excuses would have been valid that I could have written a book like 1001 reasons why not to climb mountains again. But I realized and when I look back that if I am in that zone of denial and depression and anger, nothing productive will come out. And I will be caged in that victim mindset. I will be caged by inhibitions, negativity. Everything will be there in the shackles. But can I have an escape velocity and come out of that? For me, that book helped me. Now, how long can I stay in that section? It can be in minutes, it can be in hours, days, months, years, or probably a lifetime. Who chooses that? Did someone put a gun on your head and told that you have to be in this zone? It's a choice. If we get addicted to the sympathies, which typically come in when you are there, if you get addicted to that, you lose your sense of freedom. But sometimes it is very uh, obvious that you don't have choices. Then the question comes, can we build more options for us? Because when we have only one way, I'm stuck. When I have two ways, I'm in a dilemma. And when I have more than two ways, I have choices. The more choices I can create, the more freedom I can experience. And you can get the choices, you can create it if there is no, none. Because we most often attached, attach happiness, success only to a destination. We think that if I reach Mount Everest at the top, only then I'll be happy. But I have a choice to reframe this entire conversation, enter self-talk. I can always say that every single time I go to the high altitude, I feel happy. Every single step that I take on the mountains is my success. Why not? I was never supposed to walk on this high altitude. I was an asthmatic child till my college days. I couldn't go around without an inhaler in my pocket. But one day, when I forgot my inhaler and I experienced almost a death kind of situation, I realized that I have to break this shackle, the shackles of this inhaler. And I decided not to keep that inhaler in my pocket anymore. I was okay. I had the courage to accept any outcome for that action of mine. I took total responsibility of that action, knowing that anything can happen. But the desperation was so strong to get rid of that, to get that freedom that I was okay with anything. So, you see, event happens in milliseconds. Acceptance also happens in milliseconds. And then what happens is an attitude change. Then ha what happens is action, massive action. And that lasts for a lifetime. And sometimes you might need to rewire your thoughts uh, to accommodate to your needs. Like when I went for my first trek ever in Tamil Nadu, Parvat Malai, one mountain, I was filled with fear that I will die a dog's death because I was still not convinced that whether like the last seven years I was working, reconditioning my body without this inhaler, without uh, like I was eating all those foods that I was allergic to, but I was still carrying my fear with me. But I was not sure that whether I will die a dog's death or <laughs> whether I will survive. But when I reached to the top of that mountain, and I, before that, I, I worked it out in my mind that this mountain will be equivalent to maybe a 50 story hill. So that helped me, okay, like to, to, uh, like, you know, uh, 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 to gauge how much I'm going to go there, to quantify. And then when I went to the top of that hill, I couldn't believe that I was standing at the top of the hill, my first hill. And when I was looking at the road, it was just like a thin string. And I was feeling so elated. And at that moment, I suddenly realized that I didn't have to use the inhaler not even once. And all that seven years I was doing experimentation on my body, it actually worked. And that gave me such a feeling, a liberation, as if a thousand birds were set free. And that moment I climbed my Everest. That moment I became free. That moment I conquered my inhibitions, I conquered my fear. So 
in, in, in the Himalayan, in the Buddhism, you will see a mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum. The literal meaning is very simple. There is a jewel in the lotus. Find that jewel and you will find happiness. And if you just go by that literal meaning, there is a, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But if you think, I mean, there can be so many different ways of interpreting it. But if you think in this way that, who, what is the jewel? It is us. What are those petals of that lotus? The, the inhibitions, the fear, the conditionings that, that has covered it, when you unfold all of those, just take it off, take it off, take it off. What stays back is the jewel, the real you, the authentic you. So freedom is in our DNA because long back, one, one of our ancestors might have thought, let's see, let's exercise my freedom of walking in two, two legs. He might have fallen down. But again he tried. Somebody else might have got inspired. They again tried. And today we are walking in two legs. So that DNA, we are carrying it. So that sense of freedom, we are also resonating it every time. And that's why maybe we appreciate the sense of freedom. But that sense of freedom, we already have it within us. We have to bring that childlike innocence back. We have to just watch our fear. We have to confront of our fear. And then convictions will start to get up, to be born. Then you will take small baby steps. And these small baby steps are the foundations of bigger dreams. And you will slowly start allowing yourself to dream bigger. And then, while you are following this dream, you will see there is a marked change that is happening. And this change, if you can welcome, you will get the true sense of freedom. Thank you, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity.